Before we begin this Microsoft digital event, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we live and work throughout Australia, as well as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people viewing this event today. We pay our respects to Elders both past, present and emerging, and recognise and celebrate their continuing connection to land, waters and community. Our reverence also extends to all First Nation and Indigenous peoples, as well as their ancestral lands. Hey everybody, welcome to New Breakpoint. My name's Simon Waite. We've got a great show lined up for you today. If you want to drop any comments to us about the show, ask some questions of our guests, please feel free to reach out on our Twitter channel and stick around to the end of the show uh, where we'll share the links to our show notes where any useful information uh, that we've got out of today's show will be posted. Today we've got an awesome show. We've got a couple of guests. Uh, we have Andrew Ellett, who is the co-founder of a, an Aussie startup, uh, Help Pay. He's going to talk a bit about the journey from going from idea uh, to startup uh, and talk a bit about how that worked out uh, for the team at Help Pay. And we're also joined by Jacques Bott from uh, Revium, who's the technical director there, who's been working uh, with the team at Help Pay to help deliver uh, the solution that they've got running today uh, in the cloud. So without further ado, I'm going to get uh, both Andrew and Jacques on, and we're going to have a quick chat, and then we'll get into it. All right, so now I'm joined by Andrew and, and Jacques. And uh, yes, Andrew, I said, how that worked out. So how did it work out? Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that before uh, the two of you get into today's session? Yeah, interesting choice of words, Simon, and thank you very <laughs> much for having us today. Uh, I'll probably have to say it's how is that working out? Um, I think the, okay. challenge and, the challenge and joy of a uh, any startup is, you know, as I'll talk about later today, there is no linear path. And Things mm -hmm. haven't worked out yet, and they are working out, and who knows what's next. But um, that's the fun of the, the game and the business that we're in, and uh, we're still trying to make everything, you know, a success. Yeah, no, I can I can appreciate that, and maybe uh, just for the benefit of, uh, and I'm not sure if this is something maybe you go into a little bit more detail. Maybe for the benefit of the viewers, um, you know, maybe just uh, Jacques, maybe it's a question for for you and Andrew is, you know, what's the relationship between the two organisations uh, on today's show? Uh, how have you worked together uh, to get to where you are today? Yeah, uh, I will cover this a little bit later because I think um, you know the topic that you know, Microsoft has selected about you know the journey and how to get from mm -hmm. idea to business reality is yep. you know, working out how you're going to build your tech team and form that um, is an important part. And so, effectively, probably the easiest way to describe Help Pay and Revium is a brother or sister relationship. So, separate legal entities, um, but very very closely entwined. A lot of similarities in the, in the equity structures, uh, but effectively, yep. uh, Revian is Help Pay's technology arm, and that okay. has been formed from a really solid, long history relationship and shared risk and reward. So, Jacques, what about yourself? Um, you know, do you want to tease us a little bit about what's coming up in your section later, or do you want to talk a little bit, perhaps, about you know the participation uh, in the building of Help Pay to date, uh, and give us a bit of a flavour for for the experience that it's been. What do you want to What do you want to share with our viewers? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, the Alpay journey is is really unique and interesting, and I'm really grateful to be part of this. I think it's one mm -hmm. of my career highlights to date. Um, being in tech for twenty plus years and working in different industries, uh, this was this was one of the really rewarding and challenging projects mm -hmm. we had. <laughs> We had a couple of interesting challenges, and I'll share some of those in the in the deck and how we approach this whole whole beast and how we cut it up and make it a reality. Yep. Yeah. Look, it is. Uh, I love the help pay story. Uh, I think um, you know, having having buy in, having a, a social reason, having uh, a mission, shall we say, uh, often helps you know drive uh, real focus and attention to delivering an outcome. Look, we could talk. Uh, for the rest of today's show on this, but I am conscious that, you know, Andrew's got some great content to share and people are probably keen to hear, um, you know, the journey there and get the insights from Andrew. And then also, uh, Jacques, you're coming up later to talk a bit about, as you said, the kind of the more technical focused aspects to this journey as well. 
So without further ado, uh, Andrew, I'll hand over to you to kick it off and I'll be back later to help wrap up the show. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Well, look, today I'm going to start by just you know, really talking broadly about not what help pay is, but more the mindset and the journey and how we got here and hopefully some interesting um, points to take out to the audience, particularly um, t uh, technicians or technical um, people who have probably been in tech for a long time and often think about you know, going and doing their own thing. So I've got to start by saying, it's inter interesting, Jacques, I don't know if you've read my notes, but you actually just said exactly what I want to say here. Doing a tech startup or a startup of any sort is the most challenging and rewarding thing uh, I've ever done. And I think, Jacques, you just said rewarding and challenging yourself. And that is simply the best way to describe um, what a startup is. It will push you. It will at times try to break you. But um, doing something for yourself and um, the greater good, I guess, in the instance of HelpPay, we are a social impact fintech. Um, it is the most rewarding. It, um, it requires all sorts of skill sets. And I would like to talk just a bit about to the audience today to maybe give some people some ideas about if they're thinking about going and doing a startup, um, yeah, what it, what it might be like and uh, what they'll have to yeah, look out for. So for starters, I want to uh, talk about mindset. Um, we have a term at HelpPay and we call it founder mentality. And that's for what, what that means to us is we want everybody in the business to have a mentality and approach and a drive um, that is really, um, I guess, with a single purpose, that is very motivated, that is always on the ball, and we call it founder mentality. And I think um, if you go and talk to any founder, they all have this, uh, whether you succeed or fail in your startup, and you know, nine out of 10 you know, businesses fail in their first 12 months. You've got to have a certain amount of, I guess, yeah, drive and a certain, about, a certain amount of perhaps even craziness to you to want to go and do this. The other main mindset I started this journey with was a desire to change what you do. Um, you know, stepping out of a day job, setting out, stepping out of working, you know, for a larger company or any other company and deciding to go out on your own, you've got to have, you've got to really be committed to that journey. Um, and in March 2020, when this opportunity came about, I had a good look at myself in the eye and decided, yeah, I'm ready for this challenge. I left a career of 22 years working for the same company. Um, and certainly, uh, we often joke uh, at Help Pay that for the first six months, it was a bit of a dream, market research, product planning, but then the dream becomes reality and it is simply hard work and you've got to be committed to that, um, that change. The next part of the mindset that is really important is belief, an absolute steadfast belief in what you are doing, the tech platform that you're building, the business model that you're coveting the people that you're going to work with. You really need to believe and trust in what you're doing. And at the same time, always being honest with yourself. Uh, we have a saying also, help pay, um, don't believe your own shit. You've got to be able to look yourself in the eye at your ideas and say, is this actually me just believing in something that perhaps smells a little bit and I need to pivot? Or is it actually a really good thing to pursue. And the only way to do that really initially in the early stages is through market research. I'll talk about that briefly in, in our timeline. Um, I think also you need a certain amount of thick skin, um, a bit of stubbornness. Um, you always get detractors uh, with any business and startup. It's very easy with tall poppy syndrome and um, you know people to poke holes in things. So, and that again goes back to belief, but and all these things, I guess, intertwine belief in what you are doing. Um, not believing, you know, your own stories and your own shit sometimes. Actually looking at things from multiple perspectives, but also being stubborn and, I guess, motivated enough to know that, you know, you are onto a good thing um, and believing in yourself. Another big part of a startup is seeing the big picture. Um, when you go into this land of getting a new business, a new business model off the ground, um, it's not just one skill set. It's not just technical. It's not just sales. It's not just legal. You really do need to have broad business experience. And there's different ways to achieve that. Of course, look, I'm not a technical, I don't have come from a technical background. Um, and there's ways, obviously, to form partnerships, bring in other co-founders, to bring in and supplement those skill sets that you don't have. Um, but broadly, a founder does need to be able to see the end-to-end -end needs of a business, how to find product market fit, how to fund, how to legally set up, how to 
um, get the right technical skill sets. And fortunately for us and at HealthPay, that was working with the likes of Jacques and Revium and supplementing the business model and the ideas and the structures and the capital with the best in breed te technical stack. And then again, from there, bringing in third party vendors like um, for us, Microsoft, Segment, Twilio, uh, bringing in best of breed, Stripe, uh, best of breed, internationally renowned brand names to help us also get to where we need to go faster. And all that means uh, being organized. You cannot go into setting up a business if you're disorganized. Staying on top of all these moving parts is, is certainly really challenging. Like to lastly on this slide, just talk a little bit about sales and purpose. It's really important in any business, whether you know, in business, in life, to have purpose. And if you haven't seen it before, I, I recommend you go and have a uh, Google on YouTube, Simon Sinek and purpose. It's probably one of the ex world leading experts in defining your purpose. And for us, the purpose behind this business was to make helping easier. Our purpose was to help people. Our purpose was to give people, it was to give back, to build technology that made moving financial help and financial money from people with the haves to those with the have nots. So our purpose was to make helping easier. And it's really important to talk about purpose is because I, I'm a big believer and always have been, doesn't matter what we do in life, we are all in sales. We're selling ourselves, we're marketing ourselves. It doesn't matter if you're a technician for Microsoft or a co-founder of a startup. When you cut your code, you're selling the ability of that code to do the right thing. You're selling yourself to your manager, to your team, to your colleagues. So purpose and sales is closely linked. Um, the only reason people buy, the main reason people buy is because of the purpose behind an organization. And in any startup, sales is really important. So it's intertwined with purpose. Similarly, on sales, I think there's two other elements to it's important. I'm talking about sales because I've often said in startups, they get too focused on the technicalities and forget about their pipeline and their opportunities and their, and their sales. Obviously, your product has to do what it says it will do. So, uh, so the skill sets have to be right. You have to have the right people around. You have to do what you say you'll do. Without having credibility and quality re end result, doesn't matter how good your purpose is, no one's going to buy something that doesn't work. It goes without saying. And lastly, relationships. People buy because of often not the, not the company, not the brand. It's the individual. It's the person and the relationships. And that's probably good leading to, I guess, um, yeah, what to be prepared for. And I guess the best way to sum this up in a startup, be prepared for anything. There is no linear path. And I've got a, the next slide is a bit of a, well, it's a calendar timeline. It looks like it's linear, but in fact, you you go one way, then you go backwards and then you realize, oh no, that, I tried that. I thought I'd be doing that in March, but actually I need to do that in January. And now I'll do it in June. So there is no linear pathway, but what for me uh, and for the help pay team made it, made it work was working with the right people and the relationships that we have. So uh, I've got absolute respect for founders who can go and do startups and do um, businesses on their own as a single founder. I knew for me uh, when we started this business that I didn't want to start the business on my own. I've started businesses on my own before in the past. And I know for me where I was in life and with the skill sets that I have, that I needed to use my relationships and building the right people to work with me. So I'll start with the founders. Um, you can bring in a founding team and it's quite common uh, to bring in a founding team and people to be co-founders with you, maybe six, 12, 18 months into your journey. So there's three types of founders in my definition. First, uh, business co-founders, and that's probably where I sit. Broad understanding of business, sales, pipeline, legal, structures, capital raising, everything you've learned in your career. You can see I didn't say much technical there, so I needed to bring in a tech co-founder and that was uh, effectively, um, you know, became the Revium team that Jacques will talk about later. And then I also believe in our, and whilst every co-founder has a bit of elements of both, you know, I have become a professional tester, I think, in this journey, you know, in a small startup, you're all doing every, every sort of role. So there's certainly, there's some elements of the technical work that I do do. And likewise, the technical co-founder certainly gets involved in the business issues. But I've called it also, there's another type of co-founder, it's the heart co-founder, that guiding light, that figurehead for the business, the person who gets out there and talks about it, believes in it and keeps us all going. And so, and we all have, a, we all have elements of that as well. We all believe in what we're doing at Help Pay, but I feel our third co-founder really was the heart behind the business and kept us, 
kept us solid, kept us motivated when we thought the technical challenges were too much or the sales challenges were too much or the market told us one thing and then we had to move to something else. Um, so that leads me next to organised chaos. I think it's other than the most challenging and rewarding thing I've done, probably the best way to start uh, to define or uh, describe a startup is organised chaos. You've got lists of things to do, you've got project plans, but it's organised to a point that you can't control it all. And you have to accept that you cannot control it all. There is no linear path to how a startup you know, um, grows and succeeds or fails. Timing is a big part of it. Um, you know, you need a certain amount. Uh, you need a certain amount of yeah, good timing or luck. Good luck. Um, and to the point, you know, Simon said in the introduction. Um, you know, uh, have things worked out yet? Well, we don't know. We still need to get some timing right. We still need to, you know, make sure we stay current. We still need to make sure that businesses believe in the, what we're doing and want to keep offering our platform. So for that, we'll need we'll need some good luck. And we also, what we worked out is you need advocates, advocates within your business, advocates at companies you're selling to, advocates in your shareholder base, people who actually believe in your idea and help you along the journey, which again goes to that critical issue of having good relationships with the people you work with and the people you sell to and the people who mentor you, the people who give you advice and guidance. Um, be prepared also for lots of no's. When somebody says no to you, I don't want to buy it, I don't want to take it, no, it technically can't do that. It's just another reason to try again or ask again. So in our experience, we did market research. We took our concept out to, to businesses. They all said they would take it. We had signed, virtually signed contracts. We had heads of agreements. And the last hurrah, businesses would turn around and say to us, hang on, we don't actually, you're not actually in market. You haven't actually proven yourself we won't activate the help pay platform until you get users. And so we had to quickly go back, re-engineer, change the path that we are on and prove that we had product market fit before we could then get to the business deals that we needed to sign to be a going concern. Um, it took us a long time, and I'll talk about this later, about even how to monetize our business. One of our advisors and having good people around you is so important. When we went live publicly with our product in, March, uh, in February of 2022, one of our advisors said to me, Andrew, you've now built the platform. Now you just got to work out how to, how to monetize it. And what we thought was our monetization strategy has ended up being something completely different to what it is today. So you've got to be prepared to make mistakes and you've got to be prepared to have this balancing act between time, money and quality. So a startup generally has a certain amount of runway or money to spend because you know, our business model, most business models in startups are long term. They're not about getting quickly to cash flow positive. So, yeah, how do you balance those three variables, time, money, quality, and balance innovation with risk? So for us, for speed to market, we formed a partnership with BPay, and that was a way for us to get to, to market faster, quicker, better. Um, and that's been pivotal to pick and choose those right um, larger organisations to work with. And lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about value innovation. In tech, you can try to not beat the competition, but, by, but make competition irrelevant by creating a leap in value for buyers and sellers. And that's what we've tried to do at Help Pay. We've tried to open up a new and uncontested marketplace that creates value and innovation at the same time. So we drive costs down for we got yeah, drive costs down to the companies that we sell to and value up for their customers. So it's strategic, not operational. Now the challenge with value innovation and creating a new marketplace is what we call a blue ocean. We've got a blue ocean out there. No one's done before anywhere in the world what help pay is. And we thought that's fantastic. Look at this value innovation that we've done. The challenge with it, the flip side of that and the risk with that is businesses don't understand what we're doing. And you got to, we call it our blue ocean. We have to go out there and educate. And we completely underestimated the amount of training, education, documentation we'd have to do to bring organisations with us on the journey. So we had to re-engineer our budgets to make our, our runway last a lot longer when we realised things were going to take longer than we expected. And that's probably a common challenge in any startup. I mean, you, you hear about overnight success stories and these businesses that suddenly go big. Reality is... Now, normally struggling for many years and bootstrapping and trying to make ends meet for a long time before that critical mass point and success is reached. 
All right, so a bit of a linear timeline, which is uh, uh, goes against my <laughs> a better belief because it's not linear. But look, a timeline obviously is linear in time, but this is where there was lots of you know pivots and jumps and backs and forwards. But look, we formed our idea in March 2020, and that's when we went immediately to market research and a bit of product planning. Um, we got we first of all did um, direct to consumer market research in March and April. And then when we learned, yep, there was, we were getting the right signals from the market. We then went and, and canvassed providers or businesses because um, we're a, a B2C to B play. Uh, we, we have a use case both for consumers and for end businesses. We went and spoke, spoke to prospective providers and they all indicated, yep, this is a platform that they would work with. So then it got to the July, and I want to focus on that July to September timeline, um, a time frame a little bit, because I think it'll be interesting for the audience. This is about how do you fund your business? How do you get it off the ground? And if you do have an idea, as I think lots of the audience will be, um, and think, you're right, I've got an idea. How do I go this next step? I think hopefully some of this content will be relevant to you. And I'll start by saying respectfully, if you don't leave your day job, it's a hobby. And there's nothing wrong with having a hobby where you're tinkering, tinkering away in your, in your bedroom, in your lounge room, at your desk on weekends and um, formulating an idea, cutting some code, building some tech. That's great. Get it to a point where it's not a hobby and you leave your day job. And then how do you do that? So there's many different ways to get to fund a startup. And I want to talk particularly about funding the business and how we did it at Help, Help Pay. Okay. Starts off initially with two things, bootstrapping and seeding. So bootstrapping literally just means doing it, you know, cutting your salary, going out, using your savings, using your credit card, cutting all costs, working from home, begging, borrowing, stealing, don't steal, um, fr uh, friends or colleagues, offices, working from somewhere where you don't have to pay rent. Bootstrap your idea. Do it on as low budget as possible to get it off the ground. And that also means probably seeding things personally. By seeding, I simply just mean putting some money in. Or there's two ways to fund a startup generally. There's two elements that go into any business. That is time and money. And those two elements, time and money, allow you to work out what your equity structures are. And I guess I'm saying we because in our instance, um, there was three co-founders. We all put in different elements of time and money and the output of that is the equity structure that you have in your idea or your business. And uh, we call that slicing the pie. And there's a great book. If you Google slicing the pie and um, capital structures, there's a great free resource uh, online that talks about how to work out your equity structures in a, in a business. Um, so in our instance at HealthPay, we put a combination of different cash elements, different time elements, and also our relationship with Revium where, um, who are our technical arm, and they also, Revium, this agency, also put in um, time and sweat equity to also generate some underlying equity in the core business. So it was quite a complex relationship, but as long as you work out what your value is on the time that you put in, and then work out how much time you're putting in, you can work out what the equity stakes are of your business. But going on beyond that, so that's what we did for July to September. We, um, we worked out our business planning, we did our financial modeling, we incorporated in July 2020. We cut a deal um, with our technical team. And fortunately, going back to relationships, there was already a brother-sister type relationship between the equity, uh, the founders of, of HelpPay and a couple of the founders at Revium. I've worked in digital agencies for over 20 years um, as a founder as well. And countless times I've been asked to put the agency's time and money into somebody else's idea. I would suggest to anyone thinking of doing that, somebody with an idea, and I'll go and try and cut a deal with a, a technology house or a development house to build it, is it's difficult to get across the line because technology companies have, have overheads, have staff, have costs, and they're not in there to run startups. They're there to consult and build projects and charge a fee for service. So if anybody listening is thinking about, all right, I've got the idea, but I need to form a relationship uh, with another organisation, it's challenging. Um, probably the only reason HelpPay was able to do it because of that um, yeah, sh shared ownership in both businesses by some of the co-founders. But there's other ways. Um, uh, certainly, you know, if you bootstrap a business, you could get to a point of organic growth. So simply get sales in the door and very quickly, easily, organically get enough revenue in the door to, you know, to pay your mortgage, to keep your family fed, um, to pay your rent. So, you know, you might, if you're lucky, 
and certainly we haven't been this lucky yet. We've had to raise funds to go on the long-term business model that we are. We're not, you know, our business model never never said we'd be cash flow positive for the first three years. Um, so we're always reliant on raising money. But certainly some some startups can just organically grow through sales. Um, uh, the other probably immediate funding source for a business is friends and family. Um, going to, yeah, friends and family, pitching the idea, getting them to put in money. And obviously then you've also got to slice the pie with them. I think it's worth touching on incubators. There's some amazing business incubators and startup incubators around Melbourne, uh, many run by universities, but also many run by VCs, uh, venture capitalists. Um, VCs, think Blackbird, think Giant Leap, think uh, there's, there's so many of them in Melbourne and Australia. Uh, VCs are a great source of initial funding. Generally, in my experience, they like to go early. They like to get involved early and they'll back the founder. They'll back the person uh, before the idea, but also they need to say a solid idea, a solid business model. But certainly you can go to a VC early in your process, probably give up larger amounts of equity. And also what I love about the VC community, and over the last two and a half years, I've really gotten to know this community, is they run incubator programs and startup programs, and they put in a lot of time, money and effort to helping businesses like ours grow, network and succeed. I was lucky enough to get involved in the Black, one of the Blackbird incubator programs and the networks that opened up, um, the people I met, the mentorship that I got was second to none. And there's a lot of different um, VCs that could help in that regard. So the VCs aren't only about getting equity and giving money, they put a lot back into the community as well. Uh, the next group of fundraising, and this is where we went as a business, is sophisticated investors and high net wealth people. Um, takes a uh, you know, similar amount of work as probably attracting a VC, pitching your ideas, showing your business modeling, meeting a lot of people and raising money. Um, beyond that, uh, there's probably yeah, there's institutional private banking, probably not so suited for startup ventures. Um, yeah, so probably the most common ways, uh, well, of all the terms I've talked about, look, VCs, friends and family, and getting involved in the incubator and sweat equity as probably the most common ways startups get off the ground. And then the last one I'll just touch on, I'll circle back to this at the end, um, is crowdsource fundraising, um, introduced by you know, uh, Australian Securities and Investment Commission a few, I think 2018, a new way to raise uh, small amounts of money from a large number of people, uh, different legal structures. Um, and that's uh, getting a more commonly accepted way to raise funds. And interestingly enough, because of where we are in our journey, that's how HelpPay is going to raise funds um, be in the next couple of months. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that at the end. Okay, so back to the timeline. Um, we decided, uh, there's lots of talk about MVPs, minimum viable product. One of the great things about building good teams with you and good people along the journey is they buy into your idea as well. And one of the ideas that came from one of our technical teams um, was uh, the idea of don't build an MVP, build an MDP something that you can actually take to market, not actually release because it's only it's a demo version and use that to ascertain your product market fit. So that was a decision that yeah we made fairly early in the journey and that was yeah, turned out really well for us. It, it, you can get to an MDP before you can get to an MVP. Um, in January 21, we opened our Series A cap raise. Um, and at this point, I'm going to pause for a moment off the timeline and I thought maybe at this point, probably 20 minutes into it, tell you actually what help pay is. Whoops, if I go forward the right way. So we've built an app and a platform that is all about, as I said, making helping easier. We turn every bill in Australia into its own shareable payment pay, the payment page. We're account down, not account up. So unlike, say, GoFundMe, where it's just about collecting money, we have a set amount that a bill is for. And once uh, we don't accept double payments, it can't be overpaid. And uniquely, we guarantee any payments to a bill on our platform only go directly to the provider that that bill is for. And our technology stack instantly reconciles all payments directly to that provider's billing system, regardless of what platform they're running at the back end. Um, so it really is the world's smartest way to share, help and pay. Um, Real-time updates to, to uh, helpers and customers, uh, full credit card points to anyone who pays, so whilst our go-to-market is about being social impact and helping the vulnerable, we're also just another way to digitally receive and pay your own bills. Um, but yeah, really what we've done is digitise the helping journey. Um, look, 
we were born out of COVID when we were seeing friends and family lose jobs and people in hospitality. And if we wanted to help somebody out, the only way really was to send them some money, give them some money. What if we just wanted to keep their lights on? Privacy concerns, you can't just go to an organisation and try to pay somebody else's bill. So we've built a platform that makes it easier to give and ask for help and all sorts of other features and product benefits for both consumers, users and businesses who may offer our platform. So that's what Help Pay is, but importantly, our reason for building it was to make helping easier. And it's, look, there's so many different use cases for a product like us. Um, uh, we've had uh, very heartfelt, you know, words of thanks from people in domestic violence situations, drug addiction, alcohol abuse, who need a platform like this because we're a trust mark and we can um, take away that issue of, if I help somebody, will money go to where it needs to go? Um, and on our platform, yes, we can guarantee it is. So there's, uh, we are really working with vulnerable communities, um, but also there's a lot of people on our platform equally who simply like to pay their tax bills and get full credit card points for it as well. So many different use cases. Also, I think um, adult children moving out of home for the first time, age 18 or so, parents often support with bills. On our platform, the bills can be paid directly, instant digital sharing of a bill, no questions over if I'm a father giving money to my daughter, is it going to go actually towards bills or to a new handbag? All right, so back to the help pay journey, because um, I really don't want to talk about our product and uh, today. It's about you know, hopefully impart some knowledge on the listeners, the viewers about yeah, getting a startup off the ground. So the last slide was January 2021. Uh, that was when we released our, um, our capital raise. Funnily enough, we actually uh, released it on Christmas Eve uh, 2020. And in that lead up, I literally had the chairman of our company and our capital um, raising advisor sleeping on the floor in my basement because that was the sort of founder mentality that we had to get things out the door. Literally, we had to get up early and start working. We were working late at night, just, just sleep, sleep in the house. And that's the sort of people we wanted to work with. And that's what every startup has a story like that, the things that you do to get a business off the ground. And so to make it work is about all about bringing in the right team, the right partners. As I said earlier, I couldn't go it alone. Um, people like, if I could quote the world's best entrepreneur, love him or hate him, um, Elon Musk. He's got this great video uh, that I've seen him talk about where he says three things at a startup or in a business. Work harder than your competition. If you're working 80 hours a week and they're working 40, you'll get there twice as fast. Now, I think Elon Musk is obviously next level. I think he slept at the, on the, at the factory Tesla for months at a time, but he takes it to the next level. But you do need to work hard in this sort of business, in any sort of startup. You need to enjoy it as well, I say, and Elon, Elon says, I'm borrowing his words here, you've got to have fun and, and enjoy it as you go. There'll be moments when you don't enjoy it, and that's why for me having that team and partnership and the heart founder around us made us enjoy those tough times as well. And lastly, take, take risks. You've got to take risks um, in life to, to have a go, to get ahead. Um, we don't know if we'll succeed long term yet, but we're going we're gonna to give it the best crack that we can. Be prepared for a challenge. It's not smooth. It won't be, you know, this timeline, geez, it had so many backs and forwards, as I've said a number of times already, so expect the unexpected. And also just, yeah, to reiterate what I said earlier, don't focus in one area. You've got to bring in others. It can't be all tech in a startup. You've got to bring in the sales element. You've got to bring in the legal element. You've got to bring in the right people around you. And we've been able to attract, fortunately, um, so many great people who advised us on our journey. Um, John Bertrand, for example, the skipper of Australia too, and who's been chair of many great foundations and like the Alana and Madeline Foundation, he heard about what we were doing. We just got to know him and he eventually joined us as an advisor. He's chairing our social impact advisory board, which is a separate board to our main company that will advise, that advises us how to use our core tech stack to bring the greatest good to the most number of people. Um, and we've got an amazing group of advisors who sit on that board um, as a, you know, unpaid to help us to give us guidance and fresh fresh eyes on what we're doing and making sure that we are, we're not believing our own shit and making sure that we're really considering all things that we might miss along the journey um and sharing in the success is really important with these people so uh, let me just briefly touch on employee share options plans or esops and certainly our advisory board will get some level of options or you know, shares in our business as, as a thank you and a reward to them um, I've never expected in life for people to do things for free. So yeah, but you know, uh, cash is king, cash is rare in a startup. So it's very common for 
startups to incentivize with ESOPs um, uh, for your employees, with co-founders, um, and also sharing the success also with your shareholders and your and your customers and your suppliers. Um, it's really important to share, I guess, you know, in the vision of where you're going, but also the, the wins that you have and forming, you know, keeping that relationship alive with all the different stakeholders in your business. And every shareholder is important, every employee is important, every customer is important, and sharing in that success and showing organizations and people that you work with your vision is really important. Um, and one of the things we shared in, for example, was we named five of the developers of our technology from our sister company, Revium, on our international patent, patent um, that we're going through the process of getting. So um, often patents just go in the name of the co-founders, but you know we wanted to share in that success that we were so enamored by when the developers would come to us with new ideas and things we hadn't thought of because they shared in the vision of what we were doing and they came up with some amazing amazing you know advents in the technology that we're building and took our ideas to the next level so sharing that uh with 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 jack and his tech team was something we we're really proud to do um you can see a bit of the journey there on those slides so basically now just to, to wrap up and throw to jack in a moment so what we basically have done is you know over the last six months or sorry well, sorry 12 months now but particularly in the last six things have really started to scale we've got a lot of great pr um, you know, from Channel 9 News to the Australian and you know, Fintech Australia and many different industry organisations and um, different podcasts, amazing PR, which has attracted, attracted thousands of users onto our platform and hundreds of different providers, which then led to brand agreements being signed by um, an increasingly, you know, diverse range of providers, which then leads to providers taking us on and integrating their systems and their platform directly with us to give them better social license, to show their customers that they've got a better corporate social responsibility and standing in the community by putting in place a platform like us. Um, and one of the little you know, pivots that we had to go through was initially I said earlier, the providers said, oh yes, we will sign up with you, um, help pay, we will pay you a fee. But then in reality, they said, oh no, you gotta go and prove your product market fit, get users. So we've got out hundreds of providers on our platform instigated by customers who need a platform like us. And now we take that data and we can go and talk to providers. And what we say to providers is have a better social impact for your vulnerable customers. Um, don't you know put your customers through stress by handing them with follow-up letters. Give them new digital tools to ask and give help with new safe and secure technology and deliver assistance to your customer base above and beyond the minimum standards set by the likes of say the Essential Services Commission um, you know, with help pay, we've had you know, very moving stories of people affected by you know, drug and domestic violence and the help pay platform makes it easier to help people like that. Um, just to close, I wanted to briefly touch on monetization. Um, Microsoft thought it was important just to do this. And this just illustrates my, my point. On the left-hand side there is where we thought we would collect revenue. And our market research discussions um, with providers said providers would pay us a high percentage of money collected on our platform for overdue payments. They also said they pay for analytics. They uh, we then, then those things sort of didn't eventuate. Providers then told us they'd pay us a 1% you know, transaction fee on all money we collected. The challenge we found though then, providers wouldn't actually market us um, and uh, put us out there to their customer base because they didn't really want to pay us the 1% transaction fee on all payments on our platform. So we've now moved, and this has literally taken us, you know, close to a year to resolve to a SaaS platform fee. Provider pays us a usage monthly based subscription, and and for that we make our platform entirely fee free to users. So we can't avoid paying much, uh, merchant services fees or credit card fees and VPay processing fees. But when a provider licenses our platform on a SaaS fee, we remove all those fees, and the provider gets a certain amount of quantity and value of transactions for licensing our platform all transactions instantly reconciled into their systems. And alternatively on our freemium model or the, you know, uh, the product that anyone, anyone listening to this can go and use help pay today, download it in the app store or go to our website and use our web app. Um, if a, uh, we charge a flat $1 per helper payment fee that basically just allows us to cover costs. We can't lose money on transactions. And for that guarantee that money goes to where it needs to go and taking out all the uh, questions of, of doubt, $1 per payment, um, uh, is not not a big ask average payment on our platform is about um, $80 so um, $1 tends to be accepted 
but we even remove that when a provider signs up and, and the providers can make help pay free to their customers. Um, look, that's all I really wanted to cover off today. I hope there's been something in that. Um, close by saying uh, founders are imminently contactable. Uh, there's my email and phone number. Reach out, contact me, questions, comments, remarks. Uh, we love to talk about our business. We're all passionate. I would, I would ask, um, uh, we are doing a crowdsource fundraise coming up. If you're interested in following our journey or supporting what we're trying to do for the community, please follow us on LinkedIn. You'll be the first to know about our crowdsource fundraise. And that would mean you become an equity owner in our business. But more importantly, tell someone about us. Uh, spread the word, particularly talk to businesses. If you've got businesses that you know um, collect money, uh, they should be offering help pay as a social impact way, a way to help uh, the vulnerable a more, I guess, responsible way to um, to get payments in the door. I'm always open to suggestions, reach out, questions, comments. As I said, um, we'd love to hear from anyone who's, who's listened to this. Thank you, Simon, for listening. And um, uh, I think now, Jacques, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. So now to discuss the technology side of, of this whole journey. Um, we had to come up with a strategic approach to, approach to allow us to achieve our goal. One of the critical components was how early in the process we had approached the technology decisions. Throughout the development process, we gained valuable insights into the capabilities and limitations of Azure. These learnings helped us optimize one of the use of the platform, resulting in more efficient development processes. I hope our approach and learnings can serve as a helpful guide for other teams looking to create these, their own successful app. Early on in our planning process, we identified that application could potentially grow beyond our immediate use cases we identified and even expand globally. This realization immediately stopped us considering traditional hosting and focus on cloud-based services. In addition to this, we also required a high availability environment that also we can support our growing user base. Ensuring that application is always up and running is crucial to maintaining user engagement. Given this decision to use Microsoft technologies to build the application, it was a natural fit to look at Azure. We believe that Azure's robust, scalable infrastructure will help us meet those infrastructure requirements. Furthermore, our team's familiarity with Azure services from previous projects gave us the confidence to utilize its features to their full potential. This will allow us to optimize our application's performance and deliver a seamless user experience. So how did we approach this? So the first step is you go through a rigorous process where we started reviewing all the well-built Azure architecture documents to ensure we have a solid foundation to build upon. Remember, this is just a guideline and you don't need to follow it 100%. For example, we used the web application uh, guideline and we adopted it as we needed all our other services. We then embarked building a technology stack and Andrew alluded to it earlier on, looking at the services we need to augment the application. That is things like which authentication provider to use, which payment gateway to use, SMS and email gateways to use. And then further down, which front end technology stack do we use and evaluated all of these so we built a full technology stack. We then looked at the pros and cons of each of these to ensure they meet the requirements needed for the help application. After that, we then built this minimum viable, minimum demonstratable product using these technologies. So this was again, as, to, as Andrew mentioned, is let's take this technology and make sure it will work for what we wanted to do. Um, after we've done that, we can then start bedding down these, these technologies and services because going further down the stream and, you know, you don't want to get to 0.99 and then you're stuck with, oh, I should have swapped out this technology or I need to rework this. As a startup and as, as we mentioned before, it is crucial to get that balance and the funding. So you don't want to go down a path and then later say, oh, we need to rework this because Rework equals time and money. And as a startup, you might not have these, these opportunities. So taking the time and setting the foundation right, that was probably three or four months worth of this project where we just sat through and talked through all of these things, 
did the evaluations, did proof of concept, then started to build this minimum to demonstratable product. And that helped us to lay the foundation. And I'm happy to report these decisions paid off. We we had a point where there wasn't any rework to date on, on our decisions from day one. So again, you need to make sure you've got careful planning, you evaluate the technologies and do thorough testing so that the final product also meets the requirements as you laid out. So one of the other challenges is, is finding the balance. Andrew mentioned that in his, his uh, presentation about the balance and getting the, you know, the money and time and all of those items. On the tech side, you've got the same challenge. You can't just go and sign up to the highest tier Azure plan. It, it is tempting to go and say, I want the, the big one, but you're going to pay a fortune. And again, as a startup, you might, might not have that funding. So start off with the free lower tier plans, expand as the app grows. So, and what that means is, as a practical example, how we used it is we started off with a free and low tier plans. We then got very frustrated during the testing phase because <laughs> the app was slow. And then we went through a process saying, okay, let's do a scientific approach to this. So we started with load testing the application and tweaking the load balancing and the tier, the plans, uh, the Azure plans to make sure we find the right balance. Um, one of the challenges we had is we didn't have the Azure load testing services that's now released recently uh, available to us. So we had to use third party applications and services to do the load testing for us. And again, we found some valuable insights doing that. And through that process, we were able to tweak the load balancing, the scaling settings on, on the app services, and also making sure we're on the right tier plans based on the growth predictions and modeling that the team conducted. Another cool benefit in Azure is the, the application insights and monitor. This helps you identify and pinpoint any bottlenecks, not just from an error point of view, but is the app running slow? Is there unforeseen things? So I would highly recommend you configure app insights and monitor and build some dashboards in Azure that you can just have on a screen with your systems administrator or your operations people where they can see if something goes wrong. There's more usage, might be a spike because there's a uh, news article published um, and there's a lot of interest. You want to be on top of this so you can proactively fix and not reactively go down and say, oh, I need to update the plan or my auto scaling is not working. So this again is a continuous process. It's not a set and forget. Every time you release a massive feature, go through the load testing, make sure it's working and it's performant. Don't, don't just go down a path of, saying I've done a checkbox, continue down <laughs> and run into the sunset. Um, you will find trouble later on during that. Another cool thing that Microsoft offers is the startup accelerator. I don't think a lot of people know about this one, but they give you a range of benefits and credits. So you can use the Azure platform at a low cost um, and low commitment to you. Um, so yeah, definitely you look, if you qualify for these, uh, the accelerator, take it up. And it's not just Azure, all our technology partners, most of them also got startup programs. Uh, we use Segment for the analytics side, they've got a startup program. We we successfully entered that, that program and that also helped us save some costs and get the benefit of the product. And with these services, they also offer various other freebies and which I would recommend you utilize these if you want to go down the startup journey, because it will give you the confidence to build the application and then grow and expand uh, as you as your app and your user base grows. So one of the other things is the learning side of it. So what's some of the learnings we had building the app in Azure? The first one was, I don't think Azure API management gets the recognition it deserves. It's a hidden gem in the Azure stack. Um, you know, it's a great service that provides a range of benefits. Uh, one of the key advantages is just the ability to simply add APIs and expose them to the outside world. 
but also allows you to set up security policies, track usage, monitor performance, and all of these things in a very simple and easy to use platform. In the Alpay app, we use this for uh, to allow us partners to integrate and share data to and from the application to make it seamless for them to send the data without contacting or sending a data file over email just adds value to everybody's chain and everybody gets the benefit from this. It also allows us to be a bit more real time in terms of the data we show in the application and make it more user friendly for the users of the app um, because they don't need to go and capture data or do a lot of things to get onboarded on the, on the application itself. Another significant benefit of Azure API management is the dev portal. It is a very user-friendly uh, standout feature, I think, of, of the Azure API tool set. This service is designed to be user-friendly and the maintenance, the interface is intuitive and straightforward. Um, it allows developers and partners to explore the APIs that's published and additionally to help them test and see usage reports in of the APIs that they use. It's again, one of the key learnings for us was finding this and saying, oh, this is so intuitive and easy to use. And the team could set it up within a very short time frame. And there's real benefit for Alpay to use this. And it's being used in production um, you know, today with our partners. Finally, uh, innovation. That's one of the key important pieces. Give your team opportunity to innovate. The Azure landscape is ever changing, growing day, to, day, day by day. Like I mentioned previously, Azure load testing wasn't available when we started the journey, but it's now available. So we're looking at how can we incorporate some of those features into the testing phase of, of, of the usual maintenance in the application. Another one is just give the team opportunity to explore these things. Give them the time and focus to say, Let's work on a project, but give them the time to say on a Friday or whenever, here's some downtime, please go innovate, please go find ways, or it might be based on a user need. In the Alpay case, we had the, we had the requirement, we need to upload bills with OCR, optical character recognition. Azure has got a great service being called Azure Cognitive OCR, but one of the key challenges was there wasn't a user-friendly way to, to train the model, to say, this is a build, this is the fields I need to grab. Again, with a bit of R&D, our team found that there's a form recognizer service. Again, a very user-friendly service to use. You just upload all your builds as training data, you give the model time to, to train, and after that, it is as simple as calling the data and say via API to say, I want to get data for this for this document and it returns the amount like the bill due date, the invoice date, and and the other key elements we need in the LPA application. Again, something that wasn't there day one when we started, it's there. It's another Azure service that's not getting the recognition it deserves. Um, brilliant, brilliant things. And this is just na to name a couple. I mean these these millions of others in the Azure stack that you can use. But again, you don't want to go down a path and just innovate and explore because you might add risk to the application. So, you know, you don't want to go down a path and say, let's build everything. And then suddenly you built into a corner and you can't use the app or you introduce risk into the, into the business. So this is especially something we, again, back to that balance, we very, careful not to go down a path and say, let's just do all the shiny new toys. And you need to remember the base and the foundation you set up and you need to question, does that fit into the base and stack that I've laid down? Or is there something that's outside that? If it's something that's outside that base, you need to make sure you've done the due diligence, make sure you don't destabilize and add additional risk into the application. So. That's just one of the innovation items. Another valuable learning is you always get these weird edge case scenarios. You probably feel like you're the only person that experiences this because if you 
if you go and search for it on the web, you don't find anybody else with the same challenge. So some of the key things we picked up is go through the Azure documents with a fine tooth comb, look at the known limitations of the service, go re-read re that and make sure your configuration is set up correctly. It's better to get a second pair of eyes to look at those things because, you know, sometimes you read the same thing and you're like, oh, this looks fine, but a new set of eyes will pick up something you missed. So always go and just get someone else in the team to say, did I set this up correctly? Sometimes it solves it. And in our case, we had a misconfiguration in, in one of our services and another team member went through and picked it up and that solved the challenge. If you still get stuck after that, just reach out to the Microsoft support team. Uh, we had a great relationship with the Microsoft support team where in Tenorius, where we got stuck, they would jump on a call, get the relevant people in, in the room and try and solve it through, through the process. That is, that is valuable to have those kinds of resources and support available. And again, I don't think a lot of people take the opportunity to build a relationship with the Microsoft support team. They've got dedicated teams, depending again on, on your plan and, and the tiers, and if you pay for development support, but even if you're on the free tier, I've seen that, that they're always happy to help because at the end of the day, it's a product. They will, they'll make sure it works. So that in a nutshell is sort of our learnings and our journey building the technology side of it. I hope you find the information valuable and that's help you on your journey using Azure. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Contact details here on the, on the screen now. We're always happy to help you any way we can. And I just want to thank Simon for the opportunity to present today. Jacques, thanks a lot uh, for wrapping up uh, the se session there. Uh, and Andrew, that was uh, an amazingly insightful uh, talk on you know the journey uh, as it continues uh, for yourself and your co-founders and the help pay, uh, help pay business. Um, look, lots of detail in there. We could absolutely spend a bunch of time exploring that further, but I am conscious, um, you know, we want to try and get people back onto their day and they can reach out uh, to you through the details that you've shared uh, in your individual uh, sections and also through the show notes. So Andrew uh, and Jacques, I wanted to say a quick thanks to both of you for coming on the show today. Thanks, Simon. Thank and pleasure to be here. And obviously a wider thanks also to Microsoft. Um, it was interesting, Jacques talked about that startup um, benefits you can get from Microsoft. And yeah, I, I, absolutely. They've been pivotal to us um, and the support we get from, yeah, just these you know, global leaders like Microsoft has been a really important part of our story. So yeah, thank you also. No problem. And I'll put a, a link to the Founders Hub uh, in the show notes as well for those who are interested in looking into that program. Jacques, thank you also for sharing the technical insights. Uh, I think uh, you kind of hit the nail on the head there about getting the balance uh, between innovation and going down the rabbit hole, um, you know, spot on, you know, you need to tie that innovation, that exploration probably to real business outcomes, particularly in a, an environment like a startup. So thank you very much for, for sharing that today, Jacques. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity once again. And yeah, it's a, again, we can show demos and show a lot of these, these things um, and talk the whole day about all the tech things and uh, can get real nerdy about all these things if we need to. But <laughs> yeah. also I do love the fact that you you call out API management because it is uh, it's one of those services that uh, is uh, pivotal for many of our customers. Uh, but you right, not a lot of people would necessarily look at look at that and think too 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 deeply about it. So uh, thank you for yeah. focusing in on that. So folks, that's it for today's uh, episode of New Breakpoint. Show notes link is there on the screen. Uh, the video uh, that you're watching is already on YouTube. So uh, you'll be able to find all the other episodes from New Breakpoint there as well. Reach out to us on Twitter uh, and both uh, Andrew and Jacques details were on the slides earlier and we'll include details for both Help Pay and Revium in the show notes. Uh, I'm Simon Waite. This has been New Breakpoint. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.